Mr. President, having heard the first two speakers, I have to say this House is very lucky in its future. They were both extremely good, and I wish both of them the very best of luck. It's tremendous pleasure for me to be back here in Oxford. I spent some time as a senior fellow at St. Anthony's doing Russian. I took Isaiah Berlin to lunch, which was a great pleasure. And I discovered something I recommend to you very highly, which my cat also liked, which was chicken barbecue, way up the Woodstock Road. It's a wonderful cod and chips, and I recommend it. Even Colin Dexter liked it and put it into one of his books. I feel very emotional about this topic, I have to say. I admit freely I voted for Obama twice um, and would probably, if I had to, vote for him again. Um, I wonder if you remembered or saw not very long ago, there was a, a woman called Virginia McLaurin. She was 106 years old, born in South Carolina in 1909. She's lived through 12 presidents. Last month, she met Obama. She said, I could just die happy. The video of their dance together has been viewed 35 million times. For Jonathan Capehart, who is an editorial board member of the Washington Post and a black man, he brought his mother, who is 70, and he said the look on his mother's face, he said, was as if she'd seen a unicorn to see a black president. He said it's, both, it's indescribable for most African Americans to see that man and that family in that house. It's difficult even to answer the question because it is such a powerful thing. It is powerful for us also. It doesn't heal all of our wounds, but the fact of his very presence there, to me, is already a success. Now, people have criticized him, other blacks have criticized him, for doing more symbolic things than substance. And it is true that I think in his second term, a little more concerned about his legacy, he has been, if you like, more of a black president than he was in his first term. But as usual, the problem we have with all our presidents is what the French call angelisme. It's a way we translate it as utopianism, but utopia, as you know, comes from a book. Angelism comes from the church. It's a notion of human nature that's unrealistic. It involves unrealistic expectations. And I think Obama is a, is a success, not just for having been elected twice, the first president since Eisenhower to have been elected twice with more than 51% of the vote, but because of the way he's handled himself, first his personality, his ability to keep his cool in public, to show grace and the kind of dignity the office should get but does not always get. There has been no Nixonian manipulation of the IRS. There's been no misguided Bush-era wars of choice. There have been no Clintonian sexual scandals. And if he and Michelle have fought, as the Secret Service sometimes rumors that they've done, they've done it behind closed doors. And there's been no hint of shenanigans or even drama. He also has two lovely daughters, by the way. He, but politically, he prevented a depression and he changed the nature of health care. He helped put global climate change on the American agenda. He stood up to China. He negotiated a, a free trade deal with Asia. He was elected, as you would remember, with a domestic agenda. He was hit immediately by the financial crisis of 2008, which was not his fault, but which he inherited. And he and his cabinet managed that, I think, pretty well. Then for health care, you know, American presidents have been talking about national health care for more than 100 years. Teddy Roosevelt talked of national health care. So did Nixon. Ted Kennedy failed at bringing national health care. Hillary and Bill Clinton failed to bring national health care. Obama succeeded. It's not perfect, but I promise you if Hillary is elected 
and there is continuity, I believe it will become entrenched in the American system, much like Medicare. Presidents since the Cold War have been obsessed with Cuba, partly because they've been afraid of the votes in Florida. Obama broke that miserable taboo. He ended the isolation of a failing Cuba, which I think is both to the benefit of American policy in the region and to the benefit of Cubans themselves. He came in promising to end American military involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq, two things he inherited, which he didn't start, especially the mess in Iraq left by Bush negligence after the fall of Saddam Hussein. Neither have gone terribly well, but when he felt he needed a surge in troops in Afghanistan, he did it. He chose to pursue part of the war against Al-Qaeda and Daesh and other terrorist groups with drones. And as much as that may look bad, it has created less collateral damage than conventional warfare. And when he felt he had a good chance to kill Osama bin Laden, he pulled the trigger. Far fewer American soldiers are dying in hopeless wars. And Iran, Iran, I covered the revolution in Iran. He has done a deal, it's not a perfect deal, but he has put Iran's nuclear deal, its nuclear program on hold for probably a decade. As important, he kept Israel from going to war against Iran twice, which it came very, very close to doing. The deal can be discussed, but it does give Iran space to make a set of choices about its future. And if the elections we've just had are any indication, Iran is moving toward a more moderate polity. He promised to shut Guantanamo, and he may yet, if late. My point really, and I will come to an end here, is this is about balance. You judge a presidency on whether it was better than it was bad. And I think it was clearly much better. After all, do you think the mad John McCain and the baddie Sarah Palin were, were, were going to be better for the United States and the world than Barack Obama? <coughs> And, by the way, have I mentioned Obamacare? Thank you very much. <laughs>